It matters not who you love, where you love, why you love, when you love, or how you love. It matters only that you love. John Lennon I love John. I love John. I love his wit. I love his intellectual uh, capabilities and ability. And uh, he he was right away. You tell he was the leader. the world 
Laurel and Hardy, that's John and Yoko. And we stand a better chance under that guise, because all the serious people like Martin Luther King and Kennedy and Gandhi got shot. On December 8, 1980, John Lennon was assassinated at the entrance of the Dakota, his apartment across the street from Central Park. I had a lot of conversations with people that night. Um, people were just, it, it, was, it was utter amazement, it was dismay, it was, it was hurt, it was anger. Uh, people talked a lot about, was he assassinated? Um, people kept on bringing up that we have a new right-wing administration coming in, uh, Reagan and Bush, they just beat Carter and Mondale, and that they kept on saying, did they have something to do with this? And I found it interesting that people right away were suggesting such a thing. Young people don't really know who John Lennon was. He sung about the Irish plight. He talked about how to school systems indoctrinate people. He talked about uh, overthrowing the government for peace. No money for war. And we're not doing that. If it wasn't an assassination, then it was an incredibly perfect setup for something that looked like one. I think if he was assassinated, it must have had something to do with the government. And uh, uh, because I don't see who else would want John Lennon dead. Why? Possibly because of his message and because he was a powerful voice and a lot of people listened to him and a lot of people were influenced by him all over the world. It jeopardizes the power of the establishment and any kind of authority which is trying to sway the public and keep the public and, uh, and oh, people in general from, from following their minds and being true to their heart and doing what's right. But the assassination itself was just very, very tragic because we lost someone that we'll never get back. We'll never have someone on his level. You know, I hope we will, but it, it, we haven't yet. Decades later, people still gather every day at the two and a half acre section of Central Park called Strawberry Fields to honor his dream of a better world, inspired by his music, words, and actions. Strawberry Fields was inaugurated on what would have been John's 45th birthday, October 9th, 1985. 121 countries endorsed it as a park of peace and contributed to the memorial by donating trees and shrubbery. The focal point is a circular mosaic of inlaid stones, a reproduction of a mosaic from Pompeii, made by Italian craftsmen as a gift from the city of Naples. In the center of the mosaic is a single word, the title of John Lennon's most famous song, Imagine. Strawberry Fields has become one of Central Park's most visited landmarks, with close to a million visitors each year. Every October 9th and December 8th, Tens of thousands of people from all over the world make the pilgrimage to come together and pay tribute to the greatest singer-songwriter in rock and roll history. John Callahan from Liverpool. My name is Kazumi. I'm from Japan. I'm Renata Musk. I'm from South Africa. My name is Kieran and I'm from Toronto. My name is Jean Lam. I'm from Nottinghamshire, England. My name is Sarah. I'm from Australia. My name is Christopher and I'm from Sweden. My name is Kim. I'm from Annapolis, Maryland. I'm Steve from Montreal. Hi. Okay, I'm Marcia. I'm Otavio. We're from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. This is Beatriz, this is Sophie, and I'm John Rudolph from Switzerland. Love the, love the strawberry fields, love the Beatles, love John Lennon. And it's, it's a great place, place to meet with friends for peace and love. I came from Belgium in Europe just to come here today to celebrate this, uh, this sad day. My name is Ayrton Ferrer dos Santos, short for Gary, the mayor of Strawberry Fields. I make peace signs for the world. No, I make peace signs because John asked me to make peace signs. He came to my sleep three years ago and said, what you've been doing for years, do it every day until hopefully one day there will be peace in this world. Your way of life is a political statement. At 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday, October 9, 1940, John Winston Lennon was born in the Oxford Street Maternity Hospital in Liverpool, England, to Julia Stanley and Alfred Lennon. He was reportedly born during the course of a German air raid and was named after his paternal grandfather, John Jack Lennon and Winston Churchill. During John's early years, Julia separated from Alfred and entrusted John to the care of her sister. Although John was raised by Aunt Mimi and Uncle George, his mother visited him regularly, and as he grew older, he visited her too. As they became closer, Julia taught John how to play the banjo, 
which led to his first guitar. On July 6, 1957, John's first group, the Quarrymen, were playing in public for only the second time, when a mutual friend, Ivan Vaughan, introduced him to Paul McCartney. Within a week, John had invited Paul to join the band, and he accepted. The following February, Paul brought George Harrison to meet the Quarrymen. Although he thought George too young, John recognized him as a talented guitarist who would benefit the group. On Tuesday, July 15, 1958, Julia Lennon was hit and killed by an off-duty police officer who was allegedly driving drunk. This tragic accident cemented the relationship between John and Paul, who had also lost his mother to cancer just two years earlier. In August of 1960, with a new name and a new lineup, the Beatles made their debut in Hamburg, Germany, with Stuart Sutcliffe on bass and Pete Best on drums. How did I first hear about John Lennon and the Beatles? Well, actually, <clears throat> when I wrote to Noam is to love him, uh, when I was about 17, I had heard they were performing in Germany, and I had heard a bootleg recording of it. So I was familiar with the Beatles long before they became famous. In January of 1961, they debuted at the Cavern Club in Liverpool. And by that December, local record store manager Brian Epstein had signed a contract to manage them. At this time, Stuart Sutcliffe was John's best friend. He was an artist and the original bassist of the Beatles. Sutcliffe played with the Beatles in Hamburg, where he met photographer Astrid Kirscher, to whom he was later engaged. On April 10, 1962, Stuart Sutcliffe died of cerebral paralysis following bleeding in the brain. Stuart and John are credited with naming the Beatles, inspired by Buddy Holly's band, The Crickets. In those days, when the Beatles were depressed, we had this little chant. I would yell out, where are we going, fellas? They would say, to the top, Johnny, in pseudo-American voices. And I would say, where is that, fellas? And they would say, to the toppermost of the poppermost. In June of 1962, the Beatles auditioned for George Martin at EMI Records. He agreed to sign the group, but insisted that Pete Best be replaced. And within a few weeks, Richard Ringo Starkey joined the group. During these first five years of the band, John had maintained a long courtship with Cynthia Powell, who he met whilst attending the Liverpool College of Art. They were married on August 23, 1962, with Brian Epstein as best man. In September of 1962, the Beatles recorded their first sessions at EMI Studios in London, with George Martin as producer. March 22, 1963 saw the release of the Beatles' first UK album, Please Please Me. In 2003, Rolling Stone ranked the album number 39 on its list of 500 greatest albums. John and Cynthia's son Julian was born on April 8, 1963, in Liverpool. He was named after John's late mother, Julia. In August of 1963, the Beatles played their last of 292 performances at the Cavern Club. By the end of the year, they had become the most popular band in Britain. It was like being in the eye of a hurricane. You'd wake up in a concert and think, wow, how did I get here? Before John Lennon and the Beatles first arrived in the United States, they were apprehensive about how their music would be received in the world's largest record market. Yeah, I met him on February 7th, 1964 on the airplane flight um, back to uh, America when they first came here, which was I purposely got on that flight because I was scared to death of flying, literally scared to death. And uh, I knew that that plane would never crash. And so. The media sat in the back, we sat up front. They all wanted to know about John did too, about the Apollo and uh, what America was like. They had no idea, uh, including John, what was to be expected at the airport. Uh, shock and, and total freak out was what was when they saw it through the window of the airplane. When they landed in New York City, their anxiety vanished instantly when they were greeted by over 3,000 screaming fans. I was 11 years old when the Beatles arrived in America, 
I'll never forget the headlines in the picture in the newspaper as all of my girlfriends and I flocked around to see what they looked like. We were so ready for their arrival. Two days later, the Beatles performed the first of two consecutive Sunday evening appearances on The Ed Sullivan Show. The first broadcast drew an estimated 74 million viewers, at the time a record for an American television program. Beatlemania had officially started. We saw them on The Ed Sullivan Show, and I went to the first concert at the Hollywood Bowl in California. The price of the ticket was $5. Back then, that was a lot of money. Um, I saw A Hard Day's Night 36 times in two weeks. So I'm your true Beatlemaniac fan. We were watching the, the Ed Sullivan Show with the rest of the country, and it was just this beautiful, uh, sweet, loving music that captivated me. And from that day on, I became a, a lifelong Beatles fan. They were coming to America, didn't know what to expect. They had all the success in Europe. And the last thing they had ever heard of an idol in America was Elvis Presley. And at that time, there were no videos. There was no footage of Elvis. The same piece of footage of Elvis doing the dance in Nashville uh, on some stage that Colonel Parker had taken. So they didn't know what to expect. They were scared. They were literally frightened of America and what, what it was going to bring to them. And it was a new world, and they had no idea how popular they were or what to expect. Within two months of their arrival in America, the Beatles occupied the first five positions of the Billboard Top 100 Singles Chart. They are the only recording artist in history to ever achieve this feat. And by August of 1964, the Beatles had sold approximately 80 million records worldwide. It's just such amazing music, and yeah. it's just so great that, like, it's still alive. It's amazing. You don't forget the songs. They're just every time you hear them, it's, it's like something new. You never tire of it, it's just magical. I think the, the greatest thing is that like your parents can listen to his music and the Beatles music and you can and everyone just enjoys it. It's something that like unifies. Everyone listens to it and everyone enjoys it. If something can span that great a distance, it's got to be something special. My niece who's 24 years old in Madison, Wisconsin, she always asks me, Bob, what were the 60s like? And I say the 60s had a possibility. No more, no less. They were amazing times, and there was a possibility. That possibility has gone in the toilet bowl. But when you stand here, and you see a lot of young people, and a lot of old people like myself, and older, you still think, maybe that possibility, maybe it is floating someplace up there or somewhere. We were all on this ship in the 60s our generation, a ship going to discover the new world. And the Beatles were in the crow's nest of that ship. Between 1964 and 1965, the Beatles made many huge accomplishments. All four band members played themselves in two films directed by Richard Lester. A Hard Day's Night was produced in 64 and Help in 65. These two years also saw several personal accomplishments for John. In 1964, he wrote and illustrated his first book, entitled In His Own Right, following up in 65 with another book entitled The Spaniard in the Works. In the fall of 1966, John acted without the other Beatles in How I Won the War, also directed by Richard Lester. On August 15, 1965, the Beatles opened their United States tour in front of over 55,000 screaming fans at a sold-out Shea Stadium in New York. This is the first time a stadium was ever used for a rock concert. Would the people in the cheaper seats clap your hands? And the rest of you, if you'll just rattle your jewelry. In October of 1965, the Beatles were awarded England's prestigious MBE, members of the Order of the British Empire. John comments, I thought you had to drive tanks and win wars to get the MBE. He became more as like Muhammad Ali, once he became important, he took on causes. He took on intellectual greatness. He took on the Supreme Court. He took on the war. I mean, John's greatness didn't come about until after he was anointed 
and he said those things about rattle your jewelry and and all those brilliant remarks but uh, he was far more intellectual than Dylan. He was far more sophisticated than Dylan. And Dylan's causes were in his songs. John's causes were in his heart and in his brain and his intellectual ability to say it. Dylan just were in his, as great as Dylan was and is, was as a writer and a poet. John was as a person. He was the first person in my life really to uh, express the importance of love and peace. Uh, that's what I remember most about John Lennon. To me he was one of the greatest leaders and teachers that ever walked the planet. He sure changed my life and a lot of lives of others. To me he was probably the most influential person that I didn't personally ever meet or know. I, I thought John Lennon was a bad motherfucker. He was the Beatles. You know, he was the voice voice of rock and roll. One thing John didn't know was how good he was. He never thought he was a great artist. He always thought he screwed up. He listened to playbacks and never liked them. You know, he always wanted to sound like Elvis. He always told me, you know, he loved when I put tape echo on his voice, and he loved when I mechanicalized his voice, and he, he hated himself dry. And he hated himself when he sounded like John Lennon. He never liked himself as a vocalist. He always saw himself an average singer. You know, he never knew he was one of the greatest vocal singers of all time. You know, he just never knew how great he was. My role in society, or any artist or poet's role, is to try and express what we all feel. Not to tell people how to feel. Not as a preacher, not as a leader but as a reflection of us all. In December of 1965, the Beatles released their sixth album, Rubber Soul. It marked a musical turning point and showed maturity and a significant progression from their earlier works. In August the following year, Revolver, their seventh album, was released. Many of the songs exhibited a new electric guitar rock sound. On August 29, 1966, the Beatles played their last public concert at Candlestick Park in San Francisco. For the next few years, they became a studio group, logging 700 hours of studio recording time between November 1966 and March 1967. John considered himself, bar none, the greatest guitar player in the world. <laughs> the greatest guitar player in the world. Except for George, maybe. Huh? <laughs> well, down deep, I think he considered George. But he did. He said, oh, I'm the greatest guitar player in the world. And he did. He considered himself the greatest guitar player in the world. And uh, he joked about it, but he was serious about that. And uh, he would play louder than anybody else in the studio. And uh, he just loved the way he played guitar. And uh, But on every solo, he didn't call Eric Clapton, he called George Harrison. On June 1st, 1967, the Beatles released their eighth album, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, which is often cited as the most influential album of all time by both critics and fans. In 2003, the Beatles were featured 10 times in Rolling Stone magazine's list of the 500 greatest albums. Rubber Soul ranked number five, Revolver number three, and Sgt. Pepper's topped the list at number one. On June 25, 1967, 400 million people watched John Lennon and the Beatles perform the song All You Need Is Love. The Our World program was the first ever live global television link broadcast via satellite. All You Need Is Love, when I heard it uh, on June 25, 1967, uh, it was the first time uh, that something like this happened. It was bounced off all the satellites and the whole earth saw it, and like 400 million people saw it, and I was one of them. And uh, I was brought up in the 60s, uh, and all you heard about was the Vietnam War and, and the evil Russians. And here you had this man, John Lennon, and, and the Beatles talking about all you need is love. And it was a day that changed my life. I just said, look at this. The, everything around me is so negative, and here's this guy talking about love. It just meant so much to me. Later that summer, the Beatles started to drift apart after the strange death of their beloved manager, Brian Epstein, in August. The alleged suicide cast shadows across the group and contributed to discord and their eventual demise. In February of 1968, John, Paul, George and Ringo traveled to Rishikesh, India, 
There they studied transcendental meditation with the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi at his meditation center. On November 22, 1968, the Beatles released their ninth album, simply named The Beatles. This double album, often referred to as the White Album, was ranked number 10 in Rolling Stone's list of the 500 greatest albums. John wrote with a very deep love for the human race and a concern for its future, Yoko Ono. And John would say, whenever you didn't understand anything of Yoko's, he says, I'm all God. <laughs> that was his favorite expression. It's I'm all God, Phil, you don't understand it because it's I'm on God. <laughs> so I just said it's I'm on God because I didn't understand any of it. <laughs> no, I did, I did. It was very good. But if you didn't understand it, he told everybody it was I'm on God. And if you didn't understand her music, it was avant-garde. John Lennon met Yoko Ono for the first time at her art show, Unfinished Paintings and Objects, at the Indica Gallery in London on November 9, 1966. But he was married to Cynthia, and though he was attracted to Yoko, they reportedly did not become a couple until May of 1968. The inevitable divorce from Cynthia came on November 8, 1968, and as the end of the decade approached, John and Yoko married in Gibraltar, on March 20th, 1969. I mean, they were true lovers. They were best friends, which I don't know how many people know. There was an image about them in the public, and then there was the real John and Yoko. And the real John and Yoko were really John and Yoko. I mean, they really loved each other, and they were best pals. They realized that their honeymoon would receive a great deal of worldwide media attention, and decided to utilize this to bring their message of love to the world. They staged two peaceful bed-in protests, the first took place in Amsterdam, and two months later it was repeated in Montreal. Between the two events, John and Yoko began other peace campaigns, most notably Bagism, which John explained as the most direct way to sell the message of peace. By removing the visual of himself and Yoko, he hoped that people would pay attention to their message. On June 1, 1969, whilst in Montreal's Queen Elizabeth Hotel, John wrote, performed and recorded Give Peace a Chance which became the anthem for the peace movement. First of all, he wrote a song called Give Peace a Chance to give a rally cry for people instead of fighting and find a place to become positive by using Give Peace a Chance as a anthem. It just seems to me that people who usually advocate peace, it's not what everyone else wants as far as the government is concerned. And it's really, it's too bad because it's not that difficult to put down a gun and to just love your enemy, you know. And I think that that's what John Lennon was all about and it touches me very deeply. He was not a pacifist. He was a peace activist, but peace activist does not mean being a, a, a lame-o or being a liberal or being a limousine liberal. It doesn't mean just going like this and doing nothing. And he, in his songs he said, I don't want to be part of a revolution that's violent but he didn't want to be part of the revolution. On January 30th, 1969, the Beatles held an impromptu rooftop concert at their Apple building in London. After 42 minutes, the police brought an end to the show. We've got this gift of love, but love is like a precious plant. You can't just accept it and leave it in the cupboard, or just think it's going to get on by itself. You've got to keep watering it. You've got to really look after it and nurture it. The Beatles released Abbey Road, their 11th album, on October 1st, 1969. Due to escalated tensions within the band, the album was essentially a collection of solo work, unlike their previous releases. Rolling Stone magazine named it the 14th greatest album. I mean, John broke the group up in 69 would give peace a chance. I mean, John was determined that the group wasn't going to be together. He was never going back. And uh, the Beatles just had to recognize that. And Paul McCartney made a statement when he brought Lee Eastman in as his father-in-law, a lawyer, a New York lawyer. And his brother-in-law was John Eastman, a lawyer. So political stands had been taken. On April 10th, 1970, Paul McCartney formally announced the breakup of the Beatles. At this time, their sales total stood at almost 400 million records. The Beatles remain the largest selling musical artists ever. I think 
Paul covers up the relationship a lot today by saying how much of a brother and friend and uh, close he was with John. When I think in reality, John, John had a lot more feelings of animosity towards Paul that he expressed afterwards in his writing and in his conversation. Not vehemence, but just how do you sleep at night? The day the Beatles broke up, uh, it was announced, was April 10th, 1970, and I never forget, I was, I was in grammar school, and uh, everybody in grammar school was just like so sad that here was this, the, the favorite group of everybody breaking up, and it was sort of like the end of an era. And I remember even like girls like almost crying about it, and it was, it was a sad day for everybody. Everybody knew the world had seen something very special. Released on May 8th, 1970, Let It Be is the 12th and final original album by the Beatles. It was released by the band's own Apple Records label shortly after the group's announced breakup. There wasn't going to be a last album if I didn't complete this album because there was nothing to put out. The Beatles didn't want to have anything to do with it. That album had, was recorded two years earlier. And uh, if if George Martin were there, he should be ashamed of himself to allow that to have been recorded. I mean, it's, there's no mark of any production on the album. And if you watch the film, you'll see no producer, and you'll see no arranger, and you'll see the Beatles doing everything. And as John said, it was a pile of crap. And uh, his exact quote is, he took the shittiest pile of shit and made something out of it. Well, I appreciate that, and that John told me that afterwards, and that's what led to our long-standing relationship, and that's what led me to recording with George, and that's what led me to running Apple Records, and that was a, that I put that album together out of love and out of wanting it to live up to my reputation and their reputation. The thing the 60s did was to show us the possibilities and the responsibility that we all had. It wasn't the answer. It just gave us a glimpse of the possibility. He never talked about his years with the Beatles. He sort of just sort of characterized them as pop, pop culture. You know, those were our Elvis years. You know, he didn't take them very seriously. He didn't consider himself a pop icon, pop, he considered that as sort of a, well, that was then. And John's life with the Beatles, he didn't, he didn't dwell on that. With the arrival of a new decade, John Lennon emerged as a solo artist. With his wife Yoko Ono by his side, he was ready to take on the 70s. For John Lennon's first solo studio recording, Instant Karma, he brought in Phil Spector to produce. The innovator of the famous Wall of Sound production technique, Spectre is considered by many people to be the greatest rock and roll producer of all time. You've Lost That Love and Feeling, produced and co-written by Phil Spector, is listed by BMI as the song with the most US airplay in the 20th century. I thought I'd stop by Apple Records at Three Saddle Row, and John was there. So we went down to Abbey Road, and we got a hold of Alan White on drums, um, George Harrison played rhythm guitar sitting on a piano bench. At the last minute he came down, we got a hold of him. He wasn't mic'd up, he used the piano mic on John's piano, and uh, Klaus Vorman on bass, and um, we made Instant Karma that afternoon. I went into the studio and messed it. I don't know how many days later it was, but John wanted it out that night. That's how the record came about. It was made in, uh, in mono, and uh, uh, I used the old Sun Tech Records tape echo, and John said, Sounds a lot like Elvis. Did John look up to Elvis? Yeah, John loved Elvis. He had all his recordings on his jukebox. He loved those Sun Records. He loved them. He used to dance to them in his kitchen. He had a jukebox in his kitchen in Ascot, and he used to dance to them in the morning. He loved them. He loved Elvis. This time it was my album. 
And now I have Yoko there and Phil there, alternatively and together, who sort of love me so that I perform better and I relaxed. John wasn't very close with anyone except Yoko. And I say myself, I consider him very close to me. But he wasn't particularly close with Alan White or Klaus Vormann. He just had a friendly relationship with them. But he would skip off after all the sessions. On April 23rd, 1970, a special visa was granted on medical grounds. And that summer, John and Yoko traveled to Los Angeles to explore a new therapeutic treatment called primal therapy. Whilst there, John was inspired to begin writing what would become his first solo album, John Lennon Plastic Ono Band. This album, produced by Phil Spector, contained the most personal and important music of his career. Lots of times we didn't have any musicians around, so on Love, I had to play piano because there was nobody else around. And I loved the song so much, I would go home at night and play it. So John heard me playing it one day in the studio, he all over that move that, put it on the record. And I didn't want to play it on the record. I was scared, you know. And then John kept saying, see, that's what it's like to be on the other side of the glass field. You know, and I did, I was scared. I made so many mistakes before we got it right. I remember reading about it. It was like 18 or 20 times, and John was like making fun of you almost. He was. He was. He was cracking up. That was what was my funniest moments of John, was producing me playing the piano. <laughs> he was having a boy, he would do it again, do it again. <laughs> it was just terrible. I mean, I was scared shitless. John Lennon Plastic Ono Band would become the number 22 album in Rolling Stone's list of the 500 greatest albums and is recognized as John's most introspective and best work. However, at the time it was considered a commercial failure and was the subject of much controversy, largely due to the use of the word fucking in the song Working Class Hero. I knew it wasn't going to be a commercial answer to Paul McCartney's album, which was as commercial as, you know, could be. And uh, I didn't know whether to be disheartened, disappointed, but I was joyous because I loved it. And that album would have been number one, except it was banned because Working Class Hero was in it, and Sears Chain wouldn't carry it, and Kmart and Walmart wouldn't carry it, and it only sold three or four hundred thousand. John was affected by this and wasted no time getting back into the studio. His second album would be called Imagine, and its iconic title track spoke of his utopian vision of a better world for all. You know, here's a guy who's like maybe the largest rock star in the world. And yet he takes, you know, time out and he has like this, this vision of a, of a utopia, a peace on earth, you know, and it, it's, it's such, a, it's such a, a pure idea, such a simple idea. You know, you just wish that, you know, politicians and people that are in power today could just, you know, just grasp, grasp that simple message. I think the world is hurting right now because there are a lot of people in power that are, they're just wrong. They don't care about people. They don't care about any people. <laughs> they just care about money and crap. And, and John was against that. And John tried to tell us about that. And I just want to come here and um, just you know pay tribute to the man because he really was a, a unique, gifted individual. And I believe he really loved the world. I think we may need more um, love and understanding between each other, more talking, more tolerance. And uh, I think it could go a long way throughout the world if we all tried a little bit harder. I believe in God, but not as one thing, not as an old man in the sky. I believe that what people call God is something in all of us. I believe that what Jesus and Muhammad and Buddha and all the rest said was right. It's just that the translations have gone wrong. Not only was Imagine the hit that Lennon desired to stay in the spotlight, but it would become what many consider to be the greatest song ever and the defining moment of his musical career. Even the word Imagine itself became synonymous with John Lennon. That song spoke more for John than John spoke for himself. John didn't speak that way. John didn't go around speaking, hey Phil, imagine there's no religion in this world. John said that the content of Imagine was similar to that of John Lennon Plastic Ono Band. The difference was that Imagine was chocolate-coated for public consumption. 
It came about originally as a piano lick, da 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 da, which is what turned me on right away. I said, "You're going to play that on the piano. You're not going to do this on the guitar." So he said, "Okay, you know." And uh, then I heard the song. I said, "It's it's number one song," and um, that's all we cared about at that time because we had just come off a disaster. And we were trying to make a number one album. We were trying to get off of the Plastic Ono band. We were trying to make a Beatle album. The album was highly regarded by critics and the public alike, and quickly became a number one hit. It is ranked as the number 76 album and number three single of all time by Rolling Stone. A dream you dream alone is only a dream. A dream you dream together is reality. I wasn't born when John Lennon was alive and the lyrics of Imagine are probably the most poignant lyrics today of, of any song that I know. I don't listen to uh, contemporary music because it has no meaning to me. I listen to the music of his generation more than my generation. When I first heard it, I just fell in love with the song. I thought it was the greatest song ever when I first heard it. And as I've grown in my life, it's still my favorite song of all time. It made me want to reach for the utopian goal that he has in the, the message of that song, uh, to try to be a, a better person, uh, to try not to you know, be full of greed and, and to help your fellow man. I try to live a lot of examples of what he did as far as being peaceful and realizing that we're all brothers and sisters on, in one big house called the planet Earth. There really aren't any separations or boundaries on who we are and we just really need to live together and love together and work together and be together. When we remember him and what he stood for and his name is synonymous with peace, Wherever there's peace or hopes for peace, there's John. Like I said, I think, you know, John Lennon sort of embodied the idea of peace. He's sort of the incarnation of peace and, and sort of represented a, a movement that was really important to me. And although he was a little bit before my generation, um, he was in my brother's generation, and, and therefore I got to kind of experience him through my brother's eyes. And, and uh, so, yeah, he was always sort of a symbol of peace and hope. If I'd lived in Roman times, I'd have lived in Rome. Where else? Today America is the Roman Empire, and New York is Rome itself. On September 3rd, 1971, John and Yoko left Tittenhouse Park, their home near Ascot since 1969, and relocated to New York City, never to live in England again. Because he had a lovely home in Ascot, and he loved it, and they had just remodeled it and redid it and refurnished it and put in the white piano and painted it and were very excited about it. And um, he was just captivated with New York. John was pro-New York, pro-New Yorker, pro-going out, pro-meeting people, pro-talking to anyone. Through friends of Yoko's like Andy Warhol, the artistic community of Manhattan quickly welcomed John's writings, drawings and music. His first recording in his new adopted country was the song Happy Christmas, War Is Over. It's a very funny story, but when that song comes out and it's a big hit, we're going to Jamaica one day, and on the plane to Jamaica, there's a film, and it starts off, and so this is Jamaica, so da 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 da. I said, well, Jamaica's ripped off your song, John. He says, oh, so this, you know. So I said, we got to sue these people. And the bridge of the song, and so this is Jamaica. It's the whole song, note for note. So we go back to New York, and we call the consulate of Jamaica. We're going to sue for millions, and we're going to clean up, and we're going to da, da, da. So the Jamaican consulate comes over, and immediately come over with the bags and the earth. Start talking with the ah, hello man, how are you man? You know, with the Jamaican accents and everything. Proceed to take out a recording of an old Jamaican song. <laughs> so this is Jamaica. Uh, what have you done? <laughs> it's an old Jamaican. 
song. Now, I'm not saying John stole it, but it's an old Jamaican song. <laughs> I mean, we just facially omeletted, walked out of the room, and said, thank you for your time. I guess we're not suing you. Don't sue us. <laughs> This song put to music the idea that John and Yoko had conceived two years earlier of creating posters and buying advertising space on billboards in 11 major cities to say war is over if you want it. Happy Christmas from John and Yoko. The campaign was global, but the message was directed mostly towards the United States. I thought John's Christmas War is Over said it all was a much better Christmas song and a perennial Christmas standard than anything anyone else had written for Christmas. I was so glad. I encouraged John to write that, encouraged John to record it. I said, this is going to be a Christmas standard. And now every year I hear it by so many different artists. It's wonderful. And it says so much and it means so much. No more war. War is over if you want it. And why is war no good? Because all it brings is heartache, pain, suffering, and death. Make love, not war. And what would you like to see happen to the people who, who make war? I'd like to see them change their ways. Okay. Show them what John Lennon was for. Show them what he tried to do for the world. Show them what the Beatles did for the world. And if they wouldn't change their ways, what would you like to see happen to them? Instant karma. <laughs> If world peace is not a reality when we die, then we'll be back. Until it is. These were difficult times for the United States. Racial tensions were at an all-time high, and the promised end to the Vietnam War had not materialized. John's lyrics reflected what the common person was feeling, with songs such as Give Peace a Chance and Imagine. With power to the people, working-class hero and Gimme Some Truth, he cemented his reputation as an outspoken critic of the war and the Nixon administration policies. He began speaking and performing at peace rallies. Evocative messages can reach a mainstream audience through music, and the government realized this. I'm proud to say that I was on stage with him at the Ann Arbor, Michigan concert, which was basically to free John Sinclair, who had been sentenced to 10 years imprisonment for two joints. Amazing things haven't changed that much. But the irony was that that one show that night was basically the reason that the government got on his case right away, because here's a man that was not born in the United States, and he freed a prisoner and changed a law. And after that, Nixon was all over the poor guy. The FBI took action to deter Lennon from his efforts of peace by launching a three-pronged campaign. Wiretapping, constant surveillance, and threatened deportation were the tools of their intimidation. That's when they started trailing him, and that's when they started following him. It was after that album, and uh, uh, when he made Woman is the Nigger of the World, and when he started making profound, prophetic sounds about uh, that were considered anti-American and anti-Nixon. You know, we were talking about that on the way over here, just walking here. You know, he was a, a well-spoken person. I mean, a lot of people looked up to him, you know, and he may have known too much or tried to start up too much. A person like John Lennon who tried to speak the truth, I think he's one of the most truthful people that has become you know, such a huge star, first being a rock star and then as an activist of peace as well. He used his rock star stature to bring his message across, which back in that day it was a very unique thing to do. People weren't doing that. He was one of the first. Our society is run by insane people for insane objectives. I think we're being run by maniacs for maniacal ends, and I think I'm liable to be put away as insane for expressing that. That's what's insane about it. He wasn't scared about the people following him, and he was scared about being deported. He didn't want to be deported, because he wanted to stay in America. So we set up those committees, and he was very pleased with, it, very pleased with that. So was Yoko, and we worked very hard on those committees. For the next three years, he would live under a constant 60-day notice to leave the country. But with the help of his immigration attorney, Leon Wilds, the 60-day notice was continually extended. In April 1973, at a press conference on the matter of his immigration, John Lennon spoke of his vision of a world where peace was the norm rather than the violence he saw flourishing. 
He christened this vision Newtopia, where communal love and respect reigned in lieu of fear-based religions and Kafkaesque governments. I think if we just s stop and and take a look at what we're doing as a as a nation, I mean as a as a warring country, um, and just listen to his songs and take them to heart, then I think we get a lot farther than we're getting right now. The Iraq war right now, for an example, um, it's, it just seems so tragic and yet it's still going on. And it's, it's, it's this perpetual machine and someone's profiting from it. There's a lot of negativity in the world and everybody's always getting like angry or upset and they just need to think that life is very short and we need to live it while we can and treat others as you'd like to be treated. And you need to think positive, don't think negative. His idea he tried to spread around was what life should be, how people should be with each other, interacting with each other. And so, you know, I try and live up to that and, you know, keep the idea of, of love alive. In the spring of 1973, John and Yoko moved into the Dakota apartment building in New York. But by that October, they had begun a 15-month separation, during which Lennon embarked on his infamous Lost Weekend with May Pang. May Pang was a Lennon's assistant, and in an unusual turn of events, John embarked on a sexual relationship with her at Yoko's orchestration. And what did you think of May Pang? I liked her when I originally met her. She was sort of, I thought, his secretary. I didn't know that they were involved till a little later on, sort of after the fact. Were you happy to see that May united Julian with his dad? Yes. Yeah, I was always pro-Julian. I was very glad to see Julian have success. I thought he looked a spitting image of John, and but I'm surely glad that he reunited, reunited. I'm surely glad that he had the success. I wish him all the best in the world. Musically, this was a productive period during which time the albums Mind Games, Walls and Bridges, and Rock and Roll were produced. Why did John want you to produce rock and roll? Because it was rock and roll and because we were together in California. This was our time to let loose. And we picked a public place to let loose where we should have picked a private place. It could have been greater because we were in California. We were in my home. We were with my musicians. I'm sorry I let John get out of control. I really regret that. But it was foreseeable. And what we were doing was really taking out of frustration of having worked from 1958 to 1972, 73 without a break. And this was like our party. And we let the party get out of control. During this time, John had his first number one single since the Beatles with Whatever Gets You Through the Night, which was co-written with Elton John. The host of the show said, and now here he is, the new superstar up and coming, Elton John. And John said, we don't need any more Johns. <laughs> he was pissed about Elton John. You know, eventually made him godfather of John, and they, they became very close. But when he first came out, and we don't need any more Johns. On November 28, 1974, during an Elton John concert at Madison Square Garden, John Lennon gave what would turn out to be his last public performance with an impromptu three-song set with Elton. Yoko was backstage, and she and John started the process that would eventually reunite them within a month. In January of 1975, John Lennon collaborated with David Bowie and Carlos Alomar to create Fame. That September, it became a number one single. October 1975 brought John what was perhaps the best days of his life. On October 7th, Leon Wilds finally won their case thanks to evidence he uncovered of the government's persecution of the Lennons. Two days later, on October 9th, John's 35th birthday, his second son, Sean, was born. He didn't come out of my belly, but my God, I've made his bones because I've attended to every meal and how he sleeps and the fact that he swims like a fish because I took him to the ocean. I'm so proud of all those things, but he's my biggest pride. This was the beginning of a new chapter in John's life. He officially retired from music to become a house husband and father. 
he was fulfilling his dream of retiring and becoming a father from 1975 to 1980, which is exactly what he told me he wanted to do in 1973. I thought it was wonderful. I thought he would be a perfect house father. For the next five years, John and Yoko would live at the Dakota, lovingly raising their son, Sean. There were no commercial recordings or concerts, and his activism was dramatically lessened. And the impact that he has made on my generation and the generations to come. Um, he's just a very powerful man, and I, I wish he was still here. You know, it's interesting. John Lennon in particular touched so many people throughout generations. Uh, you can see an example of it today. I have a son who's 14 years old. He happens to be a, a fan of John Lennon. If it wasn't for that, he wouldn't be thinking about uh, issues of war, issues of peace. Um, but because he loves the music, because he, John was such an insightful person, such a, such a charismatic person, my son, who's 14 years old, can, can uh, think in those terms. So that's very powerful. And the more people can do that, the more people can inspire people to do those types of things, is, is, is great. On July 27, 1976, John Lennon would finally receive his green card, making him a legal permanent resident of the United States. I was very happy for him. I thought it was, I was very, I just told him to be very careful you know, that he was becoming too comfortable and that uh, he should be more secure, be, have more security, that he should just take care of himself better. But I was very happy for him. It was a dream come true for him. But things were not as idyllic as they seemed. The FBI and the CIA were still keeping their tabs on Lennon, even after he had been granted his green card and was in seclusion. I have in my passport a notation stating that the ineligibility of my visa is withdrawn because of the Lennon precedent. He fought the court case concerning his visa problems, and he won after five years and $250,000 worth of legal bills. So I have him in my memory every time I enter this country. Sir Mick Jagger. In the summer of 1980, on a trip to Bermuda, John began to write his first new songs in five years. Home demo recordings were made as he began preparations for another studio album. On August 12, 1980, a press release announced that Lennon had come out of retirement and that he and Yoko were working on a new album. This would become Double Fantasy. You either get tired fighting for peace or you die. After so long away from the limelight, Double Fantasy was released on November 17, 1980, and was an immediate critical and commercial success. I congratulated him on the album. I did call him on that, to tell him that, and he thanked me. And I wished him the very best. I told him I thought Woman was a great song. And um, I told him I thought he did an excellent job. Back in the public eye after eight years away from the forefront of political activism, John was once again going to use his popularity and return to the streets. Tickets were already purchased to demonstrate at the Japanese American Workers' Rally in San Francisco on Friday, December 12, 1980. See, the best way to honor John Lennon is don't follow leaders, think for yourself, start your own groups, and read about what happened in the 60s and what went wrong, don't follow that. What was good about it, do it again, but do it better. And I say the best way of honor John Lennon is to be willing to get arrested when you have to, and to walk the walk and talk the talk. Listen, if anything happens to Yoko and me, it was not an accident. Just after 5 p.m. on Monday, December 8, 1980, a small crowd is gathered in front of the Dakota. John and Yoko are patiently waiting at the entrance for their limousine to arrive to take them to the record plant studio to mix Yoko's track, Walking on Thin Ice. While waiting, they are signing autographs for eager fans. One of those fans is Mark David Chapman. John signs Chapman's copy of Double Fantasy and asks if that's all he wants. Chapman tells him, yes, thank you. Yoko is quoted as saying, we were returning from the studio, and I said, should we go and have dinner before we go home? And John was saying, no, let's go home because I want to see Sean before he goes to sleep. 
and it was like he wasn't sure if we would get home before Sean went to sleep, and he was concerned about that. I'll always remember John Kennedy and John Lennon, and um, I shed tears on both of them. You know, John Kennedy, it was shocking. And John Lennon, you know, Howard Cosell told me, and he told America on uh, Monday Night Football, and uh, it's sad. And you know what's really sad? Can you imagine all the great music John could have created the last 26 years? Can you imagine what he, he would have done? I wanted to, uh, <clears throat> at that point in time, after he made the Double Fantasy album, I was going to contact him about recording. I very much, well, he got me back in the mood again, but uh, it saddened me deeply. And uh, it, because uh, I would have talked him into recording with me again. I know I would have, and he would have, and uh, it would have been wonderful. And John would have been recording, and we would have made some great records. When John left us, his murderer took away the greatest gift of music the nation has ever known. Something tells me there's more out there that uh, should be incarcerated for this uh, horrible incident. The following is the mainstream media's version of the murder of John Lennon, the accuracy of which is the subject of much debate. At approximately 10.40 p.m. that evening, John and Yoko's limousine arrives back at the Dakota after their recording session. The driver leaves him at the curb. Yoko gets out and walks past the doorman, Jose Padermo, and a few moments later, John follows her. As John walks beneath the entrance gates, he hears somebody say, Mr. Lennon. Just as he begins to turn around, he is shot twice in the back. He stumbles 20 feet towards the lobby, but is shot two more times on the way. He somehow manages to climb the steps into the foyer, where he collapses to the floor. As John walks past Mark David Chapman, Chapman is alleged to have heard, do it, do it, do it, over and over again in his head. Four out of the five deadly hollow point bullets fired struck John. Two of the bullets he sustained in the back both pierced a lung. Another severed his aorta. All three passed through his chest. The remaining bullets shattered his left shoulder bone and ricocheted, severing his windpipe. There were a total of seven entry and exit wounds. Within a couple of minutes, Officer Steve Spiro and his partner Peter Cullen arrived to find a 38 caliber five-shot revolver laying on the ground next to Mark David Chapman. Chapman is eerily calm, reading the catcher in the rye. Spiro arrests Chapman, and Cullen rushes into the lobby to find John Lennon lying on the ground, bleeding profusely. More police arrive, responding to the dispatch, and a decision is made to carry John out to a police car and drive him to nearby Roosevelt Hospital. John Lennon is pronounced dead on arrival, but a team of seven surgeons led by Dr. Stephen Lynn labored desperately trying to resuscitate him. They could not. The official time of death was 11.15 p.m. The official cause of death was hypovolemic shock. John lost 80% of his blood. No human being has ever been mourned by so many people in so many countries at the same time. Alistair Cook It was a scene of, of just hurt and people couldn't believe it. I, I was watching people all through the night coming up. I mean, in the middle of the night, people just walking up from all different directions out of Central Park from West on 72nd Street and, and up off Central Park West. And it, it was people's faces, they're crying. I mean, just literally tears flowing down their, their, their cheeks. I mean, men, women. Uh, it just came out in the middle of the night just to be there. It was, as you can see, it's emotional right now even for, uh, to recollect it. It's, uh, it was uh, the most painful, I guess, nine hours I've ever spent in my life. I was shocked. I was dismayed. I was saddened. It was like a brother. And uh, uh, um, I didn't know what to do. There was nothing I could do. Uh, Did you cry? Yeah. I cried like when I lost. Uh, losing a son or a brother. Or Lenny. Huh? Or Lenny Bruce. Or oh, Lenny. I cried like when I cried I lost Lenny. It's great thrill 
to get to work with your heroes in life, Lenny, John, you know, and you don't get that thrill in lifetime, in a lifetime to work with your heroes. Uh, um, so working with John, working with your hero. So when John died, it was like you, one of your heroes are dying, as well as one of your brothers. The world mourned the sudden loss of John Lennon, much like it had 12 years earlier with the assassinations of Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King, and in 1963 with President John F. Kennedy, but with cumulatively sadder resignation. I came out to the uh, Dakota uh, the morning after John died, which was a Tuesday, December 9th, 1980, and it was an incredibly sad day, and there were people out here for weeks. There were people out here after the vigil, which was held Sunday, December 14th, 1980. There were people out here after that because they were so grief-stricken and uh, needed to be near uh, John Lennon and his spirit. Yoko asked the world to participate in a public and private 10-minute silence to honor the spirit of John Lennon. On Sunday, December 14th, 1980, hundreds of millions of people grieved together. The world was not so much mourning a singer as a protester and a political idealist. If his death was even partly mourned as a political event, could not the motivation behind it also have been political? Sir Paul McCartney. Do you think John Lennon was assassinated? I don't know. If he, as I said earlier, if he wasn't, they did a hell of a job. If they, if they did, I mean, they got rid of so many great ones, and if they did it, if they didn't do it purposely, they might as well have, because uh, I mean, if Mark Chapman was a dupe, like Lee Harvey Oswald was. You know, he's perfect for the role. And um, he was about to start to talk, John. He was about to start to become active. It's the perfect time to get rid of him. Um, it's certainly a probability. Knowing this government and seeing some of the things that they've done, uh, it is possible that something like that could have happened. Definitely inside job. Definitely was, uh, that was the same as like with Kennedy. The government did not want John Lennon to be. You always get Apache. Like this like John Kennedy got killed by Oswald. Please give me a break. I think that the administration that's in, that stole the White House now were the people that were responsible for John Lennon's assassination. These, these were the same people in the Reagan administration. There was always been speculation that there was connection to the CIA because of his, uh, his rallies against the U.S. Maybe it was something related to politics, I don't know, to all kinds of different things that maybe brought some people to want to close, I close, I would say, put him in a box, you know, so he doesn't say anything else. So if there was no conspiracy to kill John, which I don't know that there was, they did a pretty good job. If there was no conspiracy, whoever did kill John did a pretty good job of getting rid of Medgar, getting rid of Malcolm, getting rid of John, of getting rid of Robert, getting rid of Martin, getting rid of everybody who could talk and bring the youth of America together. Anybody who thinks that Mark was just some crazy guy who killed my dad for his personal interest is insane or very naive or hasn't thought about it clearly. It was in the best interest of the United States to have my dad killed, definitely. And you know, that worked against them, because once he died, his powers grew. They didn't get what they wanted. Sean Lennon. Just as they have done since Strawberry Field was dedicated in 1985, the fans of John Lennon meet here at the Imagine Mosaic to pay homage to his music and life. I'm Joe from Catskill, New York, upstate. Um, I've been coming down here about 20 years, and uh, me and my son were good, fa big fans, and uh, it's a good thing, you know, to have to come down here and get together and, and jam, you know, it's, and remember him and what he stood for, peace and love, and it's still strong even even after all this time. I mean, it's a great thing to see. So it's a privilege for me to be here, actually as always. True, true rebel artist and even, even today people come to Strawberry Fields to 
to not just play his music, but to say his words, because they'll live on forever. Yeah, my name is Bruce LeBaron from Berkeley Preparatory School in Tampa, Florida, and this is always one of our stops. This is a spiritual shrine for us, and our students really love coming here. I believe in everything he stood for, and I think the people here, the people that show up every year, believe in what he believed in, and that's why people come back year after year. He's got devoted people who come here every year. You know, every year we all come here, and everybody, no matter what color, size, age, nationality, where you come from in the world, everybody comes here, and the one thing that they have in common is that they all love John, they all love the, his music and the music of the Beatles, they all love the, uh, just the notion that peace is just as simple as you imagining it and making it happen. Join us in honoring our greatest singer-songwriter and the most influential political artist of the 20th century with an international holiday every October 9th to celebrate his message of peace and love on Earth. What do you think of an international holiday every October 9th? I'm all for it. I'm all for it. Anything to remember John is, is, uh, is just like remembering Martin. You know, I mean, they didn't want a Martin Luther King holiday. Reagan opposed it if you remember. And it was Congress that got it through and Stevie Wonder, you know, so with just a little help from a couple of our friends. You can help make this dream a reality by going to johnlennonday.com and signing the petition in support of the creation of John Lennon Day. As the petition grows, it will be sent to the heads and governing bodies of every country on earth and the Secretary General of the United Nations. Imagine an international holiday every October 9th for all people to reflect and celebrate together. Imagine, one by one, every country on earth honoring John Lennon, a man who lost his life for spreading the message of peace and love. When John Lennon days uh, an international holiday in every country, what people can do is just listen to his music, play his music, reflect on what John's life was about, try to help people in your own neighborhood, do something better for your, your family, do something selfless that day, try to bring peace to others, help a homeless person out, do something that gives of yourself that day in honor of John and his message of peace and love. We all know John Lennon and we are here just for John Lennon and we all remember him. That would be awesome to have a, an international day for peace in honor of John Lennon. The international day to honor John Lennon, I think they should make a, a national and a world holiday for John Lennon just like they did for Martin Luther King. John Lennon is really the example of peace. He actually kind of gave his life for peace for the world. He is the peacemaker. Oh, absolutely. There should be a John Lennon day because he stood for uh, love and peace and, uh, and uh, people need to be motivated by somebody uh, like him. because he represented peace for everybody. Just like Martin Luther King, he should have his own day also. And he was assassinated just like Martin Luther King. An international holiday for John, what a super idea. I think there already probably is. It would be nice if the governments of the world or the United Nations would recognize that, but I think everybody really knows that basically uh, every day is John Lennon Day. Yeah, I think um, most adults would definitely support it. And it would be great because it would bring the, the rest of the younger generations up to speed, understanding um, what he did to change the world and his message of love. It was just such a positive message. I think a day honoring that would be, would be excellent. I think it's great. Um, few people deserve it more. And uh, as somebody who is an ambassador for peace and love and, and truth in the world, uh, who better to honor than a guy like John? I think that that would be a great idea, just to have one day a year, even though it should be all the time, but you know, a good start would be like one day a year where the whole world can just step back and just stop like the brutal violence that's going on and just reflect on how wonderful peace is and how wonderful that love is. That'd be a great idea, just uh, 
a holiday because we have Martin Luther King Day. He was a man of peace, just like John was a man of peace. So I don't see why we shouldn't give uh, John Lennon a holiday to remember on his birthday. Absolutely. Why not? He's a great ambassador. He's one of the great ambassadors of the world in history. Absolutely. I don't know why there isn't one already. I think that's crazy. If you celebrate Columbus, who like you know killed people for not finding gold that wasn't even there, and we don't celebrate John Lennon, who was you know a good person and who did good things and was trying like to get peace. I already voted for it on the internet. I'm on. I believe that there should be an international holiday because if it wasn't for John with the Beatles and also in his solo career that was cut short, unfortunately, who brought the world together through his music, through his rallying, bringing people together, you know, people really need to give peace a chance and I believe that there should be an international holiday every day for John. Every year? Every year. Right. Well, it should be every day. And that, that Bush is warning everybody, we can't get out of Iraq because it'll be a disaster. That's just exactly what they used to say about South Africa. If the blacks take over South Africa, there will be a bloodbath. They will destroy the three million whites. There will be a bloodbath. That's exactly what they're saying about Iraq now. If you get out of Iraq, if the American troops leave, there will be the worst blood. Bullshit. It was bullshit about South Africa, and it's bullshit about Iraq. Don't believe the government. And that's what John would be saying today. And that's why we need not only a holiday for John, that's why we need John. In the night, between the streams, Gun fights. I hear a sound, I hear a word that feels right. It speaks of joy and of love as man's right. With this hate all around, it seems so. All your things and your pride 